you very much. Uh, it's always an honor to speak at this conference, and for me, it's the second time that kind of amazes me. Um, anyway, so uh, how many of you have actually written the description of the talk? Uh, re read, not written, re read the description. Okay. Um, so there's this this thing in there where I say um, my presentation will contain nothing but code. And as you can clearly see, I'm already tricking you because this is actually code. Um, you can take this, you can uh, execute it in your browser console, and it's thanks to works of uh, a friend of mine, Martin Klepper, who presented this at uh, JSConf 2013. It's JSFuck. Um, and it basically turns uh, arbitrary JavaScript code into this weird thing that only has six different characters, I think. And it's completely ob oblivious to white space. So I was able to turn it down into these things that actually resemble title slides. Um, and I was speaking yesterday um, to someone who mentioned that in the, in, in the title on the schedule page, um, there's actually, uh, I was using the um, literature for uh, AE, like this, the stuff that the Danish use all the time. And it's not in here because I didn't have it in my talk title. Um, the organizers came up with it, and so I thought I need to fix this. But the problem is that encoding that into JSFuck takes a lot more space, so it doesn't really fit the title screen. Speaking of Martin's uh, work, I just want to quickly point out what I don't want to talk about this. First of all, this. It's, you can look it up. It's, um, it's not, I mean, it's maybe aesthetic in its own way, but it's not very practical, probably. And also, this is not practical. I love this. It's, um, it's also been presented at JSConf uh, 2013, and um, it is very beautiful. It has its own aesthetic, but again, it's not very practical. It's, um, uh, you can learn a lot from analyzing what Mar Martin does in here, but it's not, yeah, not very helpful for day-to-day -day stuff. So I'm going to talk about other things. And the first thing I want to talk about is programming languages versus natural languages. And if you've been here on the talk before mine, um, there was this, uh, this idea of turning natural language into something that computers can understand. And I find this approach um, very cool, and I think uh, it, it makes sense to always keep in mind that uh, programming languages kind of come from trying to figure out a way to turn natural language into something that computers understand. Um, so I have to start with a slightly controversial example. Uh, <laughs> So, how many of you know what this is, where this is from? Um, so, this is the um, official NPM coding style guide, uh, a part of it, which talks about the comma first syntax. Don't yell at me yet. Um, so, uh, I find this interesting. Um, I find the, I, so I personally, I completely, you know, I, I would never write this this way. Um, but um, to me, it's just a different set of, um, yeah, I don't know, uh, conventions that have different drawbacks and different benefits than what I would normally write. So I don't have a huge issue with this. Um, but in defense of this, um, Isaac uh, wrote a blog post uh, that some of you may have read at the time. It's, it's pretty old already where he talks about this one thing, where he says, don't compare JavaScript, I'm paraphrasing, sorry, um, don't compare JavaScript to the English language. JavaScript is not English. Um, so the argument that punctuation should be at the end is silly. And I read that, and I had a pretty strong reaction to that, because I think this is actually a weird way of thinking about this, because um, we, as humans, are used to read natural language every day. Of course, as programmers, we're also used to read programming languages every day. But I think most of the programming languages, um, you know, are somewhat kind of modeled after things that we have in natural languages as well, and that makes a ton of sense. So, to me, that argument was kind of, <clears throat> no, that's wrong. Um, 
the irony and the story, of course, is that I wanted to, um, like, because this is just an example from the style guide, and then I wanted to look up um, actual code examples from the NPM code base. And I was in for a surprise because I, you know, I don't follow that. <laughs> I don't follow that very closely. And obviously, since 2015, NPM is actually using the standard style and doesn't use comma first anymore. Um, interesting. Um, but the coding style is still out there. So if anyone from NPM is here, that might be something you want to look at. Or maybe I should, I don't know, if it's possible to send a pull request. Um, so speaking of closeness to natural languages, here's an example. I'm a Ruby programmer. I'm sorry, don't shoot me. I write Ruby. I write a lot of JavaScript too, but I also write Ruby. And to me, this is a perfect example of how a language can look like that, is, uh, that tries to mimic uh, natural language in, in some points. Please ignore the puts. Um, puts is a terrible choice for something that outputs to standard out. Um, because it, you know, what, what does that even mean? Um, but 10 times do and then do something, that's something I can show to, I've almost said my mom, which is terrible, don't do that. So you can show that to anyone who's not familiar with programming. Um, and it will make sense to them. And so I, I, I think this is a very elegant example, a very aesthetic example of how code can actually look. And just you know, an exercise for you to do in your head, turn this into JavaScript. Um, you would probably use a for loop, which is one of the constructs in JavaScript that probably resemble uh, natural language the least, I would say. Um, another example. This is Python. Um, I could have chosen CoffeeScript, but I didn't want to upset everyone in the audience. <laughs> so um, Python is one of those uh, significant white space languages. Um, and interestingly, I looked that up on Wikipedia, and the article is called Offside Rule Languages. Who has heard that term before? OK, a few people. I mean, explain that to an American that calls the thing where this comes from soccer. I mean, this uh, interesting choice of words. But anyway, um, so I just found that funny. Um, so the thing I want to point out here is in, in like, slightly modern typesetting, so since we are doing typesetting, um, we use indentation for grouping things, for categorizing things, for um, building a hierarchy of things. And the one thing that we never do in typesetting is actually writing something at the end that kind of closes down that block. You never do that. And so I think uh, Python made an interesting choice, and it works for Python, because it turns this thing into something uh, that is still pretty good to read, and it follows a convention that has been set a few hundred years ago of how to do hierarchies. Um, so there's two things, two problems I see with, um, with these kind of languages. And the first one is actually probably not a problem. So at some point, I don't know if he's, he, he's coined that, but uh, DHH, the creator of Rails, um, used the term syntactic vinegar. And I like that term because it's, it's quite interesting. And so if you imagine you have a block of code that is longer than your screen in a language like this, and you scroll down, and then suddenly it's all like, where am I? Where, where's the, like, how, where does this close? I have no idea. I'm completely lost in indentation. And so um, the language or the, the syntax punishes you for um, actually uh, doing a thing that you shouldn't do in the first place, which is writing long functions. And I found it kind of interesting. And the other issue I have with it um, is that, to me, it always looks a little bit like this. <laughs> so it's kind of off-balanced in a way. It never returns. This is weird. Um, so yeah, that's, that's um, significant white space. This is interesting. So. Um, just a quick show of hands. Who likes the, the first thing better? Who likes the other thing better? OK, everyone else doesn't have any <laughs> uh, reaction to that, which is fine. Um, so to me, 
at first, this was, you know, this is just, that's the JavaScript way, and the other is the, the Ruby way. Um, there's a complete family of, um, of languages like Ruby and Python and Lua that use the, um, the snake case, as we call it, like joining things together with an underscore. And there's a whole uh, family of languages that uses the, the camel case kind of thing. And so what's the difference? Um, turns out there's a study, I only found this one, but uh, interesting enough, that kind of tried to find out which one works better in, in, in the context of how precise can you, like how, how is the precision of detecting things and how quickly can you actually read this. And turns out that snake case is significantly faster same precision, but significantly faster. And to me, after thinking about it for a minute, that totally makes sense. So if you know how the brain and the eye in, in, together parse words and parse sentences, um, it's not, you know, you're not reading character by character, you're basically reading shapes of words. And so making out the shapes of the words in, in a function name like that is um, significantly harder if you just jam them together and put some large characters in there. Um, and uh, the underscore actually looks pretty familiar to the human eye because it's almost like a space. And there's almost, the, the underscore almost takes up no room, so there's no shape to detect in a way. That's my own almost unscientific explanation for it anyway. So why did languages choose one or the other? That's an interesting question. I have no answer for that, of course. Um, and to close this down, uh, here's something, you know, that's, that's from an example from a blog post that I read uh, during preparing for this talk by Joseph Wynn, uh, who talks about um, readability in code. And this is another thing where actually, you know, thinking about how we write natural languages can help a lot because this, for some reason, is completely more readable. You have all the blocks in there and you just use paragraphs, you know, it's, 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 it's a very simple thing and it's, it, it might sound really mundane and, and trivial, but I have seen code bases where this rule didn't, uh, wasn't applied and, um, and I don't mean Martin Kleppis uh, stuff with that or minified code. Um, the second thing I want to talk about really quickly um, is the principle of least surprise, which is something that influences language design up to a point. And I have a very terrible example for you that you all know. Like, who, who in here knows what's going wrong with these, with these lines of code? That's, <laughs> come on, show your hands, please. OMG. Uh, so, all of these things are complete garbage. Um, they parse into things you don't want them to be parsed into, and they will all balk out with terrible errors. Why is that? Because, I mean, it's JavaScript. So, um, JavaScript wants to have semicolons at the end of every instruction. Um, do you see any semicolons in here? Well, I don't. It's, of course, okay to write it because we have this awesome feature called automatic semicolon insertion, or ASI. The problem is that there are a few edge cases with ASI where ASI, the ASI stuff simply doesn't know what to do. And in this case, um, I mean, the worst example is like the one in the middle where it turns it into a division because, you know, there's a, B, there's a variable and then there's a slash, so it must be a division, and then everything goes wrong, of course. And to me, this is like JavaScript's Achilles heel in a way, because to me, from a, from a aesthetic standpoint, all of this looks totally fine. It's, you know, I, and I've seen it, your reaction that you think too, like this, is, this should be valid code. But um, you know, other languages simply have different syntax rules that, that make sure that something like this doesn't happen. And JavaScript at some point decided that it's okay to say, okay, we need semicolons, but then we don't, but then there are weird edge cases. And that makes it really hard to, to um, look at this piece of code and say, this is wrong or this is right. Um, and if you're an experienced JavaScript programmer, or if you're uh, ESLint, for example, you know that this is wrong, and you can see it and say, okay, this is 
fork out and say, OK, please change this. Um, one way to fix this is to prefix all the second lines with semicolons. Looks really beautiful. Um, so another very trivial thing. So I, I like to close down the blocks with trivial things, obviously. Um, if you can see it, what's wrong with this? Does this really calculate a sum? No, it doesn't. And that's like, that's like the, the most trivial example for validating the principle of least surprise that you can probably come up with. And it's like, nobody would do that, right? But then you just, just think about it, how it happens in code bases, and you have this, this method that, or a function that does a certain thing, and you use it in like 30 places all over your code. And then a new business requirement comes in, and you kind of slightly change the, the function that it does things a little bit different, like not changing from a sum to a difference, but something more subtle. But the name only like half matches what's going on now. Do you really want to go into 30 places and change the name? Do you have automatic tools for that? And so there, uh, th that's just, you know, that's just, don't do that. You know, don't leave it in like that. Change it to something that's correct. That's what I'm going to tell you. So if you're like, who knows what, uh, just out of curiosity, who knows what language this is? It's Lua, just so you know. <laughs> um, function and then this weird Ruby looking like syntax. OK, number three, expressiveness. This is a very, you know, one of my favorite subjects. I like expressive languages. So that's why I'm starting with this. Uh, how many of you, like, does anyone know what this is? Okay, some people, hands up, shout it at me. Yeah, exactly. It is the syntax definition for Lisp. Um, it's pretty small, isn't it? That's amazing. So there's this other thing I want to show you. Um, don't bother to read it. Um, this is a um, parser definition for the Ruby syntax. It's not like the parser definition of the interpreter, but it's just the library that parses Ruby into, um, into, um, into abstract syntax trees. And I already sped that up two times. It's like 2,500 lines or so. It's quite different, different to uh, Lisp, isn't it? So now we're done. Um, now let's look at some code examples. This is like the prototypical um, Fibonacci sequence definition for Lisp um, for recursive Fibonacci um, calculation. And hmm, I you know I'm not used to Lisp, so I look at this and go hmm I don't think I like this very much. And to me, it's like, you you know, if, if all you have lists, everything looks like a hammer. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's very uniform. And, and if, if it wouldn't be uh, correctly indented, then it would make no sense to me. And um, interesting thing, though, about the indenting, because list syntax is so simple, it's like really trivial to build uh, a, lint, a, a tool that will auto-format auto um, Lisp code for you, which is almost impossible for Ruby code, for example. Um, so here's the Ruby example. And to me as a Ruby programmer, and probably also to you as a JavaScript programmer, this makes a ton more sense. So there's syntax to define the end and the beginning of a function. There's syntax to re return something. There's um, an if thing that is kind of weird for JavaScript programmers, and it's like inherited from Perl, and I don't particularly like it, but it's, um, it works. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just, there's so much syntax in there in contrast to the, to the thing before um, that I think it's, it just goes to show that um, while Lisp people always say that having syntax actually complex Com uh, makes things more complex. It also makes things more readable, I think, for the most part, at least. Um, so here's another example. This is an incomplete example before you yell at me for something that happens, uh, could happen like this in Ruby on Rails, for example. And um, 
it's a, it's a definition for a table, a user table, or a user object that has um, a relationship to photos, so users have many photos. And this looks, to me, this looks quite elegant, um, and it looks like a declaration. And there's a reason for that, because there are somewhat the, the method call that is in there, technically, um, kind of doesn't have the parentheses around it. And that's a Ruby thing. You can just leave out the parentheses. Um, you shouldn't do that all the time, but for something like this, um, it makes a ton of sense because it, it is a declaration more or less, but technically, internally, it isn't. And um, that's just an example to show you how like flexible syntax rules can really um, uh, improve the, um, the readability and, and the expressiveness of something. The next thing I want to talk about is punctuation. Um, who recognizes the language in here? Yeah, exactly. So this is Pascal. I'm sorry, it's um, the most important thing is at the bottom. I should have changed that slide. Um, so there are two things in here that I find interesting. Um, the first one is the assignment operator of Pascal. Who loves the assignment operator in Pascal? Right, because it is a mathematically somewhat adequate description of, a, of an assignment, whereas the, um, if you compare two values in Pascal, you're using the equal sign, which means that something is equal. And uh, for some reason, we, uh, in almost every other language, we use this weird thing where we use two equal signs for um, comparison, and, or even three. <laughs> And uh, that's, that's kind of, that's, yeah, I, I like that. Um, and the other thing is right at the bottom, and I'm sorry if you can't see that, but there's um, a full stop at the end of the program. And I, I, I just um, admire that simplicity. It's like end, full stop, that's it. Um, Punctuation, there are a few languages that use punctuation. I'm sorry for another Ruby example. Um, you have the bang methods in Ruby, which basically add um, an exclamation mark to the method. And most of the time, it just means that there's a, it's a variation on a method that does something more dangerous than another method. In this case, it's a self-modifying method in contrast to a, a method that would, would uh, return a copy. And then we have the question mark methods, which denotes that uh, it will return a boolean. And that's nice because it allows you to um, prevent things like is empty or does, uh, do not, does not have contents and all jam together with camel case. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, you can, of course, put this completely over the top. And then you would end up with something like this. So who knows what this is? It's a programming language. Actually, it's a programming language. It's APL. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a very old language, and it uses all kinds of mathematical characters to express things. And um, you know, just think about how weird it would be to input this language. Um, and so back in the days, that was before computer screens were really a thing, so they had to come up with a printer hat that would be able to print these things. And of course, also, you needed a special keyboard to be able to put this in. And um, yeah, that's probably overdoing it a bit with the, with the symbols there. Um, another thing that um, improves expressiveness is operator overloading. And I don't even have an idea if this is really um, operator overloading technically, um, but in Ruby you can just override the array accessor, and that's pretty nice because you, know, you can do various things with it. There are other languages that do operator overloading. Um, if you haven't heard of, like, who knows what this is? It's a language that has been talked a lot about a few years back, and I haven't heard a lot since. It's Dart. Um, and Dart has operator overloading, that's how it looks, and that's pretty nice because you can just take two objects, um, add them together, and something meaningful, meaningful comes out of that, and that just makes for more beautiful code, I think. This is Ruby examples again. Like having to, yeah, being able to do a substring on something just by uh, adding square brackets to it. Um, I think this really makes a difference in how expressive a language is. Number four. Shared aesthetics, and I'm going to close, close up with this. So there's lots of stuff I have talked about, 
And I have also talked a lot about, uh, I, I've, I've written in my description that um, this thing um, Remy was um, uh, talking about, like nobody um, agrees with you on, on terms of aesthetics. Um, I have something that we probably all agree on, and that's that this is probably not a good idea. I stole this from a tweet. I kind of, I kind of like the attitude behind this. <laughs> It's like you can you can actually write Java code without curly braces and semicolons, except that you can't. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean, see from your reaction, you're agreeing to this. What I find interesting about the JavaScript community, though, that there's there doesn't seem to be a strong shared understanding of how JavaScript should look like. Other languages do it a little bit differently. For example, we have Python. Um, which has in PEP8, PEP is like their proposal system for new language features, and PEP8 is one of the first, you know, obviously one of the first texts written by the man himself, Gita Rossum, and it kind of documents meticulously how you should write Python, how you should indent things, how things should be named, and all of that stuff. And it, you know, if you're a newcomer to Python, you just read that thing and internalize it, and you're done. That's pretty cool. Um, you might not agree with everything in there, but that's how things are done here. So maybe that's not so bad. Um, we have a similar thing in Ruby. It's the community style guide. It's not really official, but people start to adhere to it uh, due to the fact that the guy who wrote the first thing here also wrote a pretty good linter. Um, that's a nice trick. <sighs> so in JavaScript, we have something like this, which is the, you know, the the Crockford style guide also relatively uh, detailed how you should write your JavaScript. And I guess like 90% of the community nowadays disagrees with it, which is fine. Um, and then we have this uh, standard. Who loves standard? Uh, just a few hands, interesting. So standard JS is, um, is pretty cool because it, you know, it just defines a, a more modern set of how JavaScript should look like. But I can't get over this. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I have no idea. I, I would love to know why this is. Um, probably someone can explain it to me um, later on. Um, but uh, what I wanted to point out is that there are a set of languages, and I think Go, they were not the first, but they kind of um, have the strongest stance on this. Like, if you're writing Go and you're not using Go format, the official Go formatter, you're just doing it wrong. Like, everyone else is using that. And so the Go community also doesn't have problems with um, figuring out how you should actually write Go code. And there are a ton of other things. And the last thing I want to point out is Elm. Um, who loves Elm? Uh, a few hands. Um, I like Elm. I, I've never built anything spectacular in it, but I, I kind of like the approach, and I like also like the approach that it doesn't come with this huge baggage of I have to know what monads and um, endo functions are before I can actually start writing functional code. Um, I like that approach in the communication, um, first of all. And Elm format does this weird thing. And with this, I kind of liked you to marvel at the irony of a presentation that talks about aesthetics and code that begins and ends with two slides of comma first code. Um, and I want to close down with saying that the reason I wear this t-shirt is because I'm currently trying to build um, a greenkeeper that works for Ruby. And so if you're also writing Ruby code and not only writing JavaScript code, please come talk to me afterwards. And with that, thank you.